Hello, it's Micah. Um, I know it is late into August, at least when I'm filming this, but I still decided that I wanted to do like a first half of 2024 reading wrap up. So January through June, I'm probably going to go through it pretty quickly just because of course I didn't really take notes on the books and I don't want to discuss them in detail or at least I'm not prepared to. So I'm just going to be going through on my story graph to see the books that I finished and just kind of give my uh, gut reactions. First book that I read this year is Agatha Christie's Partners in Crime. Um, I have these hardcover editions that are part of a, a set. I think this was my first Tommy and Tuppence book. There aren't actually too many of them. I think in total she only did five or six and this is the second one that they're ever in. It was a collection of short stories so that was kind of fun to get quick mystery hits and I just remember thinking that Tommy and Tuppence were very old school. <laughs> the way that they're written, the way that they talk to each other, it felt to me like I was watching kind of a, a 1920s guys and gals kind of thing. So it was initially published in 1929 so Maybe I'm not that far off. It's just the way that they talked and the way that they talked to each other. The gender roles were very stereotypical, but I didn't mind it. And I, I remember too, I think this is when they're early on in their lives. I think they're in their early 20s. So they're kind of like young, young pups. And I'm gonna have to put up pictures for a lot of these because I am a library reader. Most of these books I borrowed from the library and don't own. The next book that I read was True Biz by Sarah Novich. I really liked it. It's however, <laughs> I really liked it however. Just very generally, it's about a boarding school for deaf and hard of hearing children and you follow multiple perspectives. A couple of them are students at the school and one person is I think like the president or, or something like that of the school and it's fiction and it's kind of modern day. I really liked it because I'm interested in languages in general and American Sign Language especially has its own culture and just unique set of things. It was fun to see in the book they had different pages where they would stop and kind of teach a little bit of history or teach some signs for certain things. I did see people say that that kind of took them out of the reading because the informational pages weren't necessarily related to the book and I, I agree with that. I think a lot of the times they felt out of place but it was nice to read a story that you don't get, usually get to read and I was having a really good time with it until about the end. I think the way that it wrapped up just wasn't satisfying, wasn't how I wanted it to be. It was something that I liked overall and I'm, I'm really glad that I read it and I'm glad that it exists um, but I hope that there's more in the future that we can we can all read and enjoy. For some of these books where I did keep any quotes I wanted to see what quotes I kept and read them. And so this is my journal. It started out as a quote book and then that, that, that just didn't work out and I kind of rebranded it rebranded it as a commonplace notebook but ever since I rebranded it as that it has mostly been quotes so I, I, I don't really know what to call it. She would learn as much as she could and do whatever she could to dismantle all that she knew to be broken brick by brick by hand if she had to. She would keep the bricks though she would use them to build something new. And I don't really want to talk about the quotes. I feel like once I start talking about it that's when it becomes very obvious that I don't have like a final thought. <laughs> so for whatever reason, these quotes kind of like inspired me or meant something to me or were interesting to me. Then the next book that I read was another Agatha Christie. It is Postern of Fate. And when I read these books, I just kind of pick them out randomly. So it turns out that this one is actually another Tommy and Tuppence book. And it's the last Tommy and Tuppence book. So there were five, so this was the fifth Tommy and Tuppence book, and they're a lot older. They're 60s or 70s. They're, they're kind of of a retirement age, and unfortunately just did not really enjoy this book. The story was slow. There's a lot of conversations that are repetitive and a lot of conversations that don't lead anywhere and don't get you any new clues and I kind of looked into this book briefly and just kind of wondered why it was so different from all the other Agatha Christie books that I've read and enjoyed 
and this was actually the very last book that Agatha Christie published before she passed and I think at this time in her life if I remember correctly she wasn't writing the books herself she was dictating to someone so I'm sure that kind of played a part in the like repetition and liberty of the story but yeah so unfortunately a posturn of fate I held up partners in crime you can't tell I can tell but posturn of fate um unfortunately not not a book that um not an Agatha Christie book that I enjoyed even though I usually do the next book that I read was Fourth Wing by Rebecca Yaros. I have a friend who has been really into the like romanticy genre, so she recommended it to me even though I was vehemently against reading it or any of the others. But because my friend recommended it, I'm like, okay, fine, I'll finally read it. And I almost DNF'd it in the first chapter. Just something about the way it was written. You're like in this kind of high fantasy world there's dragons, there's not modern technology, but the main character is still kind of saying things that are like very modern and very internet. I'm trying to remember what she was saying. I can't recall any specific like words or phrases right now. After the first chapter, I kept pushing through because I wanted to at least read half of it. And I don't know if I just got used to the writing or if it got a little bit better, but I ended up really liking it. I had a lot of fun. I still don't think it was a good book, but I had a night, like I had fun reading it. I will read the sequel. I'm not in a rush to, and I've heard that it's not as good, <laughs> but I'll, I'll still read it. I'm a sucker for dragons. I'm a sucker for fantasy. And there are some characters that I did fall in love with. It, it was fun. And then I do actually have a quote from Violet. I think that's her name, the main character, <laughs> but she's talking to Dane, who's like her childhood best friend. And so she says, I know you just want to keep me safe, Dane, I whisper, but keeping me safe is keeping me from growing too. And I think, I know I just said I wasn't going to talk about any of these, but um, out of context, I think that was something that was interesting to me. The next book that I read, a bit of a whiplash, I read Minor Detail by Adania Shibli. The translator was Elizabeth Jacket. This is a Palestinian author, so that was one of the main reasons I wanted to read it. With everything going on and the genocide in Palestine, I've been wanting to read more Palestinian authors, have that perspective more in my everyday literature. It's a short book. It is one that I still think about every so often, so I feel like it's a book that I might buy might buy in the future. In the first half, it's a fictionalized recounting of true events. It describes the rape and murder of a young Palestinian girl by Israeli officers. The second half is fictional and it's, so the event that is described in the first half, I believe happened in the 1950s or 60s. And then in the second half, it's um, contemporary and you follow this woman who kind of knows about the story and gets this idea to learn more about it. So she exits the wall, she's going through Rafa and Gaza, and she's kind of revisiting the army base where the events from the first half took place. So in a way, she's retracing the steps of the events, and then you just kind of see the parallels of the modern day story with the um, his historical story. The quotes that I took were very long, so I don't want to read all of them, so let me just kind of pick and choose. It's from the second part of the book, so it's the modern contemporary part describing life in Palestine very casually. She says, by the way, I hope I didn't cause any awkwardness when I mentioned the incident with the soldier or the checkpoint or when I reveal that we are living under occupation here gunshots and military vehicle sirens, and sometimes the sound of helicopters, warplanes, and shelling, the subsequent wail of ambulances. Not only do these noises precede breaking news reports, but now they have to compete with the dogs barking too. And the situation has been like this for such a long time that there aren't many people alive today who remember little details about what life was like before all this. And then another one also from the second part. I keep listening, my ears trained to the sound of repeated bombings, and I feel a strange closeness with Gaza, as well as a desire to hear the shelling from nearby and to touch motes of dust from the buildings being bombed. The absence of dust brings an awareness of how profoundly far I am from anything familiar and how impossible it will be to return. The next book I read was Patron Saints of Nothing by Randy Rebe. It is young adult fiction. It's about a Filipino-American t 
teenage boy describes kind of his relationship with his cousin who is living in the Philippines and his cousin is going through just kind of the difficulties of being in a poor neighborhood, getting caught up with drugs and the government. It actually goes a lot into Duterte and the dictatorship in the Philippines. So I thought that that was really interesting and important, not only for young readers, but for any reader, just because I know those aspects of like Filipino culture and history are not as like common and widespread stories. There are times where it felt like it was very like Filipino American 101. I don't know if that's just because it's not a genre that we have a lot from and we as a public don't have like that common base of knowledge to fill in those gaps. There were maybe some things that were telling instead of showing and I would have liked it to be more subtle but that's also because I am half Filipino and so a lot of those things that were being told were things that I already knew but I I did really enjoy that story. I thought it was nice to have a main character who is a young male. He kind of has to go through and reckon with emotions and feelings and toxic masculinity. The story actually gets pretty, not very dark, but for like YA, I guess it got a little bit darker than I thought it would just because again, the cousin in the Philippines dealing with drug use and a dictatorship, those themes were very real and very serious. From the book, I took quite a few quotes as well, but I'll only read a couple. So this is from the perspective of the main character. This is not technically a spoiler because it's in the, the blurb about the book, but the cousin that lives in the Philippines is murdered, and that's kind of the impetus for the book. Jay, oh, so that's the main character's name. Jay trying to find out um, how this happened, why this happened, coming at that with a Filipino-American perspective which causes a lot of friction. So when he first finds out that his cousin has been murdered, he says, I should be crying or throwing my controller down in anguish, but I don't do any of this. Instead, there's only a mild confusion, a muddy feeling of unreality that thickens when I consider the distance that had developed between June and me. How do you mourn someone you already let slip away? Are you even allowed to? This quote is from Jay, the main character, reflecting on his relationship with his cousin June. June was very like intelligent and inquisitive and would always ask him big life questions. Jay is saying of that time, I answered all of the questions as honestly as I could, even if my answers were dumb. I mean, I'd never had to give much thought to most of that stuff before. And even if I had, the answers lived inside of me. And when I pulled them out into the light, they were pale, weak things. So a big part of the book is that once the murder happens and Jay has all these questions and things that he wants to figure out for himself, he goes to the Philippines to stay with his cousin's family. And he hadn't been there, I think, since he was very, very young. So again, he's reconciling it with a lot of the poverty in the area as a like middle-class Filipino-American. And he says, It strikes me that I cannot claim this country's serene coves and sun-soaked beaches without also claiming its poverty, its problems, its history. To say that any aspect of it is part of me is to say that all of it is part of me. The next book that I read was No One Belongs Here More Than You by Miranda July. I did not like this book. So many of the like blurbs and reviews and quotes about it call it laugh out loud funny and warm and compassionate and sweet and they, they give it very just like warm, cozy, like nice, bright, cheerful views. And I felt like every trigger warning possible was in that book. A lot of it was just like weird taboo stuff that kind of felt like it was in there for shock. Like I can't really even talk about those things on YouTube, I think, without getting flagged. So just know that it's not like fun, cozy feelings. It's there's, there's like a lot of weird deviant stuff happening. I felt like it was more for shock. I would like to be wrong. I would like to like enjoy it and feel like that added a lot to these stories, but I just didn't feel like it did when I was reading it. However, it was written beautifully <laughs> and I did save a lot of quotes. So it's a lot of short stories. Each short story, except for like maybe one, is just like depraved in some way. It 
I don't know, I didn't understand it. I can't remember the context around a lot of these, and I feel like a lot of these quotes out of context do sound nice and wonderful, but I wish I remembered the context. The one that I will share, have you ever wanted something very badly and then gotten it? Then you know that winning is many things, but it is never the thing you thought it would be. I feel like that was this book. It was never the thing that I thought it would be. <laughs> After that, I read Nickel and Dimed on Not Getting By in America by Barbara Ehrenreich. I actually read the like revised edition. So it was initially published around 1998, 1999. I think the second edition was about 10 years later, so around 2010. Uh, it's nonfiction. I don't know if she's a journalist necessary, necessarily, but a woman who's like a, a researcher or writer of some kind who wants to see like what life is like working these minimum wage service jobs in America. I think there's four different jobs that she takes and she goes to different states so she'll go to like some state for a month. She'll have to live only on the wages that she makes from a cashier job or from a hotel cleaning job. It was interesting to read. I'm glad I read it. I don't remember where I came across it or where this recommendation was. It's obviously outdated. So I would like to read something that's more current. It was still like useful to see how things were in 1998 and what is similar to today, what's different. I don't think it was life-changing or so important that everyone needs to read it, but I think it is a type of book that uh, we should all be reading. I read Elena Knows by Claudia Pinheiro, translated by Francis Riddle. So this one is also one that I really enjoyed. I also think about it randomly, so I think this is a book that I would plan to purchase in the future. It's about a woman who has a chronic illness. It's the aftermath of her daughter dying by suicide because Elena is her mother. I know my daughter didn't die by suicide. I know that's not her. And she kind of goes on this journey despite her the limitations of her body and her illness. She physically kind of travels to different people in different places to try to piece together what really happened to her daughter. And some of the quotes that I have here, I've noticed that my camera will stop recording at I think the 30 minute mark, but we'll start over. And if Elena with her sternocleidomastoid muscle and her drool and the sleeve that won't let her arm in wants to keep on living despite all that, she can't believe that her daughter wanted to die. She can't believe it. And another one from Elena where she's talking to somebody, she says, I do want to live, you know? In spite of this body, in spite of my dead daughter, Elena says crying, I still choose to live. Is that arrogance? I think I have two more, three more. So next I read Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants by Robin Wall Kimmerer. I do have this book. I wanted to love this book so much more than I did. I have seen so many glowing reviews about it. It has like a very high rating. And I did save a lot of quotes uh, from this book. It's nonfiction. The author just kind of shares anecdotes from her life where indigenous knowledge was relevant to like her current situation. Um, she's an ecologist or a botanist so like when it was relevant to just kind of life in general or when it was relevant to maybe something she was studying in school or researching in a lab i think for me 400 pages was just too long it got a little repetitive and i think if it had been 200 maybe 250 pages i would have liked it a lot more which is such a bummer because i did like it and i just wanted to like it so 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 much more so in the beginning, she's sharing various um, versions of like indigenous creation stories. It says that the first person was Sky Woman. She fell from the sky and like the, the plants and the animals of Earth, which was the giant turtle, um, Turtle Island, came together to help her. Um, there's huge themes of like community and elder knowledge, right? Um, and respect for nature. In talking about Sky Woman, she says, she came here with nothing but a handful of seeds and the slimmest of instructions to use your gifts and dreams for good, the same instructions we all carry. 
She accepted the gifts from the other beings with open hands and used them honorably. I think there's a lot of nuggets of wisdom in here that are really great for just kind of how to live your life, how to like navigate in this world, especially in this like very consumerist capitalist society. And there are definitely quotes in here that fight back against that. In a world of scarcity, interconnection and mutual aid become critical for survival. Wealth among traditional people is measured by having enough to give away. In a culture of gratitude, everyone knows that gifts will follow the circle of reciprocity and flow back to you again. This time you give, and next time you receive. Both the honor of giving and the humility of receiving are necessary halves of the equation. We can starve together or feast together. All flourishing is mutual. I think there's a lot to learn from indigenous viewpoints about how to be a like human that respects earth and respects nature, which we are not different from, but a part of. For a lot of people, this may be their first encounter with that type of thinking. So I can see how that might be a lot more impactful. Um, but again, I just wish it were just a little bit quicker. The next book I did have, but I actually just gave it away. I put it in that little free library in my previous video. It was a book that I received as a gift in high school, probably. A Study in Sherlock, Stories Inspired by the Holmes Canon. And it was edited by Leslie S. Klinger and Lori R. King. So they did not author any of the short stories, but they are the ones who curated the book. A lot of the stories from the authors were written for this book, perhaps all the stories, I'm not sure. It's just kind of each author writing a short story in their style, in their take on Sherlock Holmes. And for a lot of the stories, they are writing Sherlock and Watson. For some stories, they're just kind of Sherlock inspired characters. I think as with short story collections, some stories were better than others, but for this particular collection, I don't think any were standouts for me. So that's why I didn't feel the need to keep the book. It wasn't strong enough as a whole, but it was still like fun and interesting to read. I did take some quotes. So there's a story called The Imitator by Jan Burke. And I don't think this was one where Sherlock or Watson were characters. I think they were inspired by but it's the, the closing of the story. For the time being, we are in the country. We're old men till young boys of war, and some of us who've seen it hope it never comes again, knowing it always will. The last book that I read in the first half of 2024 is Arsenic and Adobo by Mia P. Manansala, and it's a cozy food murder mystery and it's the first in a series there's a again filipino american filipino american who was living in a big city and she moved back home because things in the big city just didn't work out she's always had a passion for food she's always wanted to open her own restaurant her um, parents are both deceased and her aunt is who she lives with and her aunt does own like a very traditional Filipino family style restaurant in this small town. And as soon as she's back home, there's a food critic who is just being like mean and nasty to her restaurant and all these other restaurants for no reason. And the food critic was actually like her high school sweetheart. And he and his stepdad come to the restaurant and they're being like rude and snobby and whatever. And because Leela is kind of back in town for the first time and hasn't really talked to him since they broke up. She's like put off by this and also being like rude and snappy back to him in a way. And then he dies eating their food. And so that turns into a whole thing where they look like they're the ones that murdered him. They have to close down the restaurant. She's under investigation. Her, her aunt's under investigation. It was similar to Patron Saints of Nothing in the sense that sometimes some of the like Filipino elements were tell, don't show. But again, is that just because this isn't something that like we as general readers come across very often and maybe like editors told these authors that they have to include these elements more specifically? I have no idea. That was kind of one of the gripes that I had and then my main gripe actually was that I had seen someone put this in their review and I think it captured it pretty well but 
I don't want to read a murder mystery where I'm smarter than the main character. There are just a lot of things that Leela was doing or not doing that were just so like frustratingly wrong that it kind of took me out of the reading experience. And it's funny because like, again, it's a series. So you, and it's, it's a cozy. So you know that going forward, she's going to be like pulled into these investigations to help out. But by the end of the book, I'm just thinking to myself, like, I don't understand why the detective would pull her in because she like was not helpful and she didn't do anything. But again, I'm so like glad I read it. It was a lot of fun because it is a like food book. I didn't know what that meant at first. This was my first like cozy food, whatever. But there's lots of scenes where she's eating or cooking and then they go into great detail about like the textures and the flavors and the smells of the food. And there are actually some um, recipes at the end of the book which I did snap pictures and I saved a couple, but I haven't um, baked any of them yet. Yeah, so those are the books that I read in the first half of the year, January through June. I don't think I'm ever gonna be like the kind of poster who's going really in depth about each book and like themes or like even kind of describing the quotes. I just wanna, I'm mostly documenting for myself and kind of giving these quick hits of like gut reactions first impressions, um, very like archival. So I just kind of want to know what I read and a little bit of how I felt about it. Uh, I should have mentioned this first, but you'll notice that I didn't share any star ratings and the five star rating system just doesn't, something about it, like I just can't like connect, especially with books too, they can be so subjective. So it's like Fourth Wing, for example, again, like I don't think it's written well, I don't think it's a good book, but I did have fun. So I gave, I would give that a three, I guess. But then for Nobody Belongs Here More Than You, Miranda July, I like didn't like it at all. I thought the themes were like uncomfortable and weird, um, but it was written very well. But because I didn't vibe with it, I would give it like a two. So I don't know, star ratings to me just don't really make sense the way that I want them to. So really for me, it's just kind of like, am I glad that I read the book? Because I am a library reader. Is this something that I want to purchase? Is this something that I want to keep with me in my life and like bring forward into the future? Or is this something where I'm just like, I like didn't need to read that, you know, didn't add anything to my life. When I do second half of 2024, hopefully it is not like two months later, but thank you for watching. Hopefully I cut this down. Hopefully it's chopped up and a lot more palatable to get through. Um, but thanks for watching. Consider liking, subscribing, leaving a comment, and I will catch you in whatever the next video is. Thank you.